morning. My name is Noel Wilk, and I have the privilege of serving as Associate Provost. On behalf of the Chancellor and Provost, it's my pleasure to bring you greetings from the University of Mississippi and also welcome you to the 38th Hartman Lecture. As a pharmacist and a professor of pharmacy administration, it's always enjoyable to have the opportunity to spend time with the people in my academic home. The School of Pharmacy is clearly one of our outstanding programs that brings national attention to our university. We realize that this is due to your hard work and dedication. Thank you. This university was the state's first university chartered in 1844 and opened its doors to 80 students in 1848. Since that time, our great institution has endured many a trial and tribulation. Each time, we have emerged a stronger, and more stable university. A university persistent in the pursuit of creation and the dissemination of new knowledge. This is because of the dedicated people at our institution. This is truly a historical place, and oftentimes we think of the university as the spot, the place, the buildings, because they endure. Yet none of those things are as important as the people who are using those enduring places, the students, the faculty, the staff, and the alumni. This distinction between people and places was recognized shortly after the founding of our university when attorney William Stearns, who became the university's first law professor, said in 1854, this beautiful, healthy, and fertile spot has been selected as the site of a university. Abundant means have appropriated to erect the necessary buildings. Let this institution succeed, and no man can estimate how many poets, orators, statesmen, and divines may hear before. We certainly are proud of our buildings and our campus, and it's one of the most beautiful places I've had the privilege of seeing. In fact, it's been ranked one of the most beautiful campuses in the nation by Newsweek. Yet, just like the efforts of our people, this formation that Professor Stearns refers to is the result of human interactions and experiences. Similarly, the creation of new knowledge and the dissemination of that knowledge and information is the result of the efforts of our faculty and our scientists. In fact, even the knowledge and information are human constructs. The place is simply the location where it all happens. That's what makes this lecture significant. It honors an individual who had a significant individual on all of us here today. And as you will hear about in a minute, Dr. Charles Hartman and his accomplishments certainly played a pivotal role in the history of our university and our school. And if you look at the list of lecturers, you will see that these people have played significant roles in our discipline as well. Today's speaker is no different. It's easy to lose track of the human connection to accomplishment. Named lectures help us remember important roles that previous leaders have played in our progress. It is my hope that you will also reflect on the people you interact with today, your student colleagues, your faculty, the administrators of these schools. Because it's through those interactions, your opportunities will spring forth. It's from those exchanges that your knowledge will advance. And it's from the efforts of those people that will make our university even stronger tomorrow than it is today. We are glad that you're here. Welcome to the University of Mississippi. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the School of Pharmacy, I would like to thank you all for attending the Charles W. Hartman Memorial Lecture. I would especially like to thank Dr. Wilkin for his welcome and his attendance today. This lecture series began in 1973 to honor our school's third dean, Charles Hartman. Dean, Hartman, dean Hartman's lecture was tragically cut by an automobile accident 45 years ago. Today, we remember Dean Hartman for his many accomplishments on behalf of our school, pharmacy education, and pharmaceutical research. An Alabama native, he served as a pharmacist mate in the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps. He received his pharmacy and master's degrees at the University of Georgia. After receiving his Ph.D. from the University of Florida in 1956, he joined the University of Georgia's pharmacy and pharmacy administration faculty. Five short years later, he became the dean of our school of pharmacy and set about taking it to new heights. He secured funds to construct Phaser Hall, which still stands today as one of our main buildings on campus. 
He also created and maintained our Search Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, now a world-renowned institute that comprises three centers. Dean Hartman's research interests range from drug absorption to pharmacy administration, and he was granted eight patents related to his numerous investigations. He also was, consulted, was a consultant to the U.S. Public Health Service, Vice President of the Mississippi Association for Mental Health, and active in the American Pharmacists Association and many other groups. Sadly, this champion of pharmacy education, pharmaceutical research, and our profession was installed as Vice President of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy only five days before his death. Dr. Ron Bourne, a retired, retired faculty member who was hired by Dean Harmon, said that he was a true visionary, a dreamer, a goal setter, a goal achiever, a doer, and a leader. He also said that Dean Hartman was motivated who believed, was a motivator who believed in us and had us believing in one another. It is undeniable that Charles W. Hartman left an impressive legacy and a profound impact on the school. We are pleased to honor his legacy and to acknowledge Dean Hartman's many contributions to our school, our profession, and our state. Please join me in acknowledging Dean Hartman. Thank you. Now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our lecturer, Ms. Susan Cantrell. Susan is the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Americas for, Drug, for the Drug Information Association, or DIA. As some of you may know, Susan is an Ole Miss alumna and graduated from the School of Pharmacy in 1983 with a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy. As Senior Vice President and Managing Director for DIA, Susan is responsible for the organization's strategy in North, Central, and South America. Prior to joining DIA in 2011, she worked for the American Society of Health System Pharmacists and served in multiple roles. Under her leadership, ASHP became the only pharmacy association accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education as a provider of continuing medical education for physicians. One exciting thing about Susan is her passion for mentorship. She feels so strongly about this that she co-authored a book, Letters to a Young Pharmacist, Sage Advice on Life and Career from Extraordinary Pharmacists. If you read our Pharmacy Matters newsletter, you may have seen the story about the book and how it is, has impacted young professionals. It is safe to say that Susan has led a meaningful career. We are absolutely honored that she has taken time out of her incredibly busy schedule to be with us and to deliver today's lecture. We are also happy to see her friends and family uh, in the audience as well. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Susan Cantrell, our 2015 Charles Jerry Hartman Lecture. especially in my work at DIA and prior to that at ASHP, 
who I consider to be real trailblazers in this area of patient empowerment. They've moved us ahead in so many ways. I think you'll enjoy hearing about the work that they've done. But most importantly, I want to talk about patient empowerment, the rise of the expert patient, and what it means to pharmacy practice and healthcare delivery in the future. And then also we have to think about where do we fit into this, and I expect that we'll be leaders, that you'll be leaders, so we'll talk about that as well. So as we mentioned, um, I graduated um, many decades ago, and um, in thinking back on that as I uh, sat where you are, um, one change that I thought about uh, as I was coming here to just give you some perspective for your students about how things are so much different, I was contemplating my career path in pharmacy, and I realized that I had an interest in hospital pharmacy. And I had an opportunity my last year at pharmacy school to meet one of the leaders in our profession in hospital pharmacy, who's also a fellow owner grad. I hope some of you have an opportunity to meet him one day. His name is Bernice Greenland. He practices in Georgia. And um, he talked to me about a program that he was starting at University of Mississippi Medical Center. And it was called a pharmacy residency program. And it feels so absurd for me to admit this to you today but I had never heard of a pharmacy residency program in 1983. So after he explained it a bit more, I became interested and I decided that was the right path for me. So I applied to that residency program and became the first resident uh, in the state of Mississippi and the first uh, resident to complete the program at University of Mississippi Medical Center. At the time in, in the U.S., I'm of the understanding that there were 280 students or recent graduates enrolled in general pharmacy practice programs, residency programs at the time, which is now the PGY-1 program, and I suspect some of our students are applying to that. Um, so fast forward 32 years, we had the, match, the national match two weeks ago. There were over 5,000 applicants to the match for PGY-1 residencies and another 1,000 for, for specialized or PGY-2 residencies. So we've come a long way in our pharmacy education, and I like to think that that's moved us in a very positive direction. Another thing that happened about the time that I graduated um, was um, about two years before I wore the cap and gown, the first direct-to-consumer advertisement for a prescription drug appeared when Merck advertised its pneumococcal vaccine in the Reader's Digest. And I suspect there are many of you that don't know what the Reader's Digest is. <laughs> um, that's a relic of the past as well, in many ways. Uh, but that would ignite um, a, a decades-long discussion, debate, controversy about prescription drug advertising. Uh, that in some ways still continues today in many forms or, or fashion. But what that did do was allow access to patients to talk about prescription drugs. It opened up the national conversation about prescription drugs, and it allowed companies to talk about their products. Yes, they have to be fair balanced. There are a number of regulatory restrictions on that, but it really started a conversation, and it helped us also in many ways to begin educating our patients about prescription drugs. So I think that was a very important um, development. But of course now, here's where we are today with um, uh, prescription drug advertising. Our patients only have to go so far as turning on the television set, flipping through a magazine, opening up a website to read pretty much everything they would be interested in knowing about prescription drugs. So I think that's particularly important to all of you future practitioners because you are dealing with a much more educated patient than I was dealing with 32 years ago. And I think that challenges us in many ways. So definitely being able to talk and create a conversation openly about prescription drugs with patients, um, create curiosity, if you will, and give them information they needed to be involved in their own decisions is an important milestone in patient empowerment. And I'm curious to know how many of you in the audience recognize this gentleman in the picture? A few, not very many. Okay, so the other thing that happened um, when I was uh, graduating from this fine university is that uh, this gentleman, C. Everett Koop, was Surgeon General of the United States, an appointee of President Ronald Reagan. And uh, Dr. Koop would become, during his period of time, 
uh, a staunch advocate for patient empowerment, for patient engagement, and also a really strong public health voice in a period of crisis that was the AIDS epidemic. So I so clearly remember when the first uh, AIDS patient was admitted to the University of Mississippi Medical Center while I was there. At the time, we called it HTLV3. Uh, we don't use that uh, language anymore, um, but uh, many things have changed. At the time, there was so very little that we could do for this patient um, because the first drug that was proved effective for AIDS would not even be released until a number of years later, 1987, when AZT came to market. So it was a difficult time for our country, and uh, we struggled with this public health crisis and how to manage it. Um, but one byproduct of it was, the, in the picture that you see on the screen, there was a group that emerged called ACT UP, and a number of other patient advocacy groups that were advocating on behalf of having effective therapies for the treatment of AIDS, to stop the spread of AIDS, as well as um, affordable therapies that would extend life. And the quote that you see there, uh, this gentleman, Jim Igo, was one of the early founders of the group ACT UP, and, and we can think what we want about their methods, but there's no question that they were highly effective in making some changes in our regulatory infrastructure that led the Food and Drug Administration to be able to approve drugs at a much more fast pace and became the precursor of something that Congress signed into law a couple of years ago that uh, as part of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act that requires FDA to have a patient-focused drug regulatory approval process. So I think it's an exciting time. But just to put it into context, as, as Jim Igo wrote in our journal, BIA's journal, a couple of years ago in a 30-year retrospective on the AIDS epidemic, he said at the time it was taking seven years to, or more to approve a drug produced in the United States. <clears throat> but people with AIDS were living less than two years after diagnosis. So we can do the math on that and see that that is not a, a sustainable process. So I think definitely patient activism that arose from the AIDS epidemic in the early 1980s was a major and important milestone in increasing patient empowerment. Another thing that happened that I think is relevant is uh, later in the decade, in the 1980s, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors were approved by the FDA. And that in itself might not have been as important as the national conversation that took place as a result of that. So we all know there remains today even a stigma attached to mental illness in certain cases. Um, it was worse then. And people did not often talk about bouts with depression openly. They didn't talk about the challenge with mental illness. But these drugs and their availability um, caused this to become part of the national healthcare conversation. And books like Prozac Nation and listening to Prozac hit the shelf. I can't say they hit Amazon because Amazon wasn't around then, <laughs> but um, you, could, you could buy the square books. Um, but, uh, we also saw that uh, some, some very notable uh, celebrities, Mike Wallace and author William Styron, began to write about their own bouts with depression. And part of this overall conversation was that patients needed to become more involved, more active in managing their own health care, and mental illness was part of that. But not every product, as we know, has lived up to its expectations. Um, I can recall as uh, reading the clinical studies and knowing that uh, eventually we would have an inhaled insulin product on the market and thinking about the burden of diabetes, especially in our state of Mississippi, uh, but in so many others and worldwide, uh, thinking myself as a pharmacist that um, having inhaled insulin available would revolutionize the treatment of diabetes and probably help us so much better manage the patients than they had been in the past. Well, that certainly did not happen um, because um, you can just look at this device and think, um, I don't know about the ladies in the audience, but that would not fit in my handbag. <laughs> and so we have to think about patient acceptance of something like that. There have been a number of products that haven't lived up to their potential in helping patients because patients weren't involved in the early conversation about the drug development. They weren't, they weren't given a voice in the discussions about what is important to you, not only in terms of how you use the product, but what you're looking for in terms of the outcome. So 
So I'll just tell you a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, about the organization that I work for and why this topic of patient empowerment is so important. DIA is a professional society, a uh, global professional society of uh, individuals who are involved in drug development, discovery, and management. So our members work in research and development. They work in safety and pharmacovigilance. They work in all areas of medical affairs, um, in the industry as well as in the regulatory agencies. And so we're all about bringing new innovations to market to help treat patients better and also to help prevent disease. So what we've been doing at DIA for a number of years is um, involving the patient in these conversations. We have a scholarship program where we bring patients to our national meeting and our global meetings so that they can talk with the people that are doing the development work and with the regulators who are approving these drugs and they can tell them what is important to them. So that's why this topic is so important to me. I'm seeing a sea change in the way products are developed and the role of the patients and I think it's very exciting. And those of you who are entering practice soon will certainly see that. You'll have patients that um, may actually come um, into your pharmacy or into your healthcare facility knowing a little bit more about a newly approved product than you do. And that's a little scary. But also, it's a very good thing. But perhaps the one tipping point when it comes to patient empowerment and the right of the expert patient is the implementation of our many ways and channels for communication, which um, we're all very excited about, uh, but in many ways they create some challenges, and more on that in a minute. But it's hard to pinpoint exactly when all of this started, um, and I won't say that I remember, but um, looking at the history in 1993, America Online, um, a term that we don't use much anymore, uh, AOL connected its fledgling email system to the internet, and that opened up a channel of communication for a number of people. So you had in the early 2000s, uh, Facebook launched um, in a Harvard dorm, and YouTube shortly afterwards. Uh, Twitter began to chirp a couple of years later, and now is certainly an important channel for healthcare communication. And then, of course, we had our first smartphone in 2007 here in the U.S. that gave us access um, to all types of information at our fingertips. It's hard to believe that we ever lived in a world that didn't have these things, but now that we do, we have to figure out how do we optimize those. So I think social media and this um, uh, availability of information at our fingertips at any moment in time to look up something um, certainly has been a major milestone in helping empower our patients and give them more information. So let me just ask you to consider a few statistics especially those of you who are entering the profession in the next few years. Um, these numbers are likely to grow as well, uh, but three out of every 10 Americans say that they either always or frequently turn to the internet to find answers about their medical questions. And 70% of those with either college or advanced degrees trust medical information found on the internet. I'm not sure that that's a good thing, I like to think that we would be more, a little bit more discriminating, but I think that's a very interesting statistic because we all have seen information that is uh, shared that's not necessarily uh, good science. Almost two-thirds of 63% say that they um, have never misdiagnosed themselves when they've gone online to look up information and try to diagnose their own condition. <coughs> So a few other statistics that I think are very interesting is um, almost half of all Americans, as we all know, live with one or more chronic conditions, and that number is growing as well. And of those, about a third say that they've gone online specifically to try to figure out either what medical condition they have or someone else has. So they diagnose themselves and their neighbors. <laughs> So um, individuals that are providing care, and, and those are individuals that we all deal with on a regular basis, they're pro providing care for another person, um, and especially um, common in the elderly community. Uh, those caregivers, 72% gather information online, compared to only 50% of those who are not caregivers. So I think that's an important statistic for us. And then if you look further at that, 39% um, of caregivers manage 
the medication for a loved one. And they need our help, obviously, we know that. Um, and I think this uh, next statistic is very interesting. Um, of that amount, only 7% use either online or mobile tools. And if you look at how many mobile tools, how many online um, websites, how many apps are available to ma manage medications, I think that number is really low. And so I think this presents an opportunity for us as well. Um, we can provide those patients with the tools that they need and those caregivers with the tools that they need. But we also have to be judicious about selecting them. And we do know right now that the Food and Drug Administration is looking at a strategy for regulating certain mobile apps as medical devices. So I think we'll see more about that in the future. Um, but certainly, right now, we're in a little bit of the Wild West where there's very little protection. So the National Cancer Institute uh, has looked at this issue as well and conducted a survey recently. And I think this is very interesting um, when they ask individuals um, the most recent time that they looked for information about health or medical topics, where did they go first? We would hope they would come to us, come to a physician or other healthcare providers, um, but not so much. Fewer than 20% said they did that. Um, almost two-thirds said the internet was their first stop. So we need to expect that those patients will come to you armed with information. And sometimes the information is not good information, as we know. Um, and I think we've seen that firsthand uh, with the recent measles outbreak and some of the erroneous information that's been shared uh, broadly on the internet and through social media channels um, about uh, um, the risk associated with vaccines. Um, I have to tell you, though, as a former Mississippian uh, living outside of the state, I was really proud to read about Mississippi uh, being among the highest in terms of childhood vaccination rates in the country. I think that's something for the state to be very proud of. And just to provide some context around it, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Gupta, in a story that he ran on CNN during the midst of the measles outbreak, um, shared that the prevalence of a serious adverse event associated with a measles or, or a vaccination is one million patients who receive the vaccination. And you contrast that with the risk of aspirin-related intracerebral hemorrhage, 12 for every 10,000. So when you look at the numbers like this, it really provides a very different context. This is information our patients need to know so that they can make the right decisions about their health care. So you all, as pharmacists, will be entering the, the profession soon, dealing with patients. The world that you're entering is one that is at the intersection of empowered patients and the rise of patient-centered care. This will be your practice environment. Another major milestone that helped to propel forward this concept of patient-centered care and patient empowerment was a report that was released in the early 2000s, uh, 2001, by the Institute of Medicine called Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system for the 21st century. This report contains a tremendous amount of information on this concept of patient-centered care. And um, I, I think it's funny to think about um, uh, us believing that the concept of patient-centered care was, was so uh, revolutionary, if you will, because um, what was care before it became patient-centered. And we talk about patient-centered and patient-focused drug development. Well, if it wasn't focused on the patient before, what was it focused on? But these are important concepts that we all need to know about. So the Institute of Medicine, in its 2001 report, defined patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. Patient-centered care, it went on to say, is an essential foundation for quality and patient safety. And I think that is important information for us to know. But not everyone um, drank the iron Kool-Aid and bought into this concept of patient-centered care. And, and I think this is funny for us to look back on. Um, but uh, there was an article that appeared in a few years later, 2007 issue of Time magazine, and it was written by an orthopedic surgeon 
uh, Dr. Scott Haig, who at the time was practicing at the prestigious Columbia uh, Medical Center. And um, he was talking about an encounter that he had had with his patient and uh, how empowerment of patients was not a good thing for the medical profession. Um, in fact, he had recently had a patient come into his office armed with all this information. Coincidentally, her name was Susan. And um, she had researched, he said, her condition on the internet. And she had even gone so far as to research his background and credentials before she came to see him. He was outraged by this. And he called this type of patient a blood sucker, or brain sucker, sorry. A brain sucker patient because they take up all of your time with their incessant questions and they think they know everything and they're, they're far too aggressive for his taste. The title of the article was, When the Patient is a Googler. And his quote that I think is so interesting is, he went on to say what he thought the ideal patient looked like. So you can see there that nurses were his favorite because they know our language, they're used to putting their trust in doctors, and they laugh at his jokes. <laughs> but engineers as a class, he thought, um, were possibly the best patients because they're logical, they're accustomed to the concept of consultation, they're interested in how the doctor thinks about their problem, and they know how to use experts. So I don't know what Dr. Haig is doing now. Um, I doubt that he's gone on to um, uh, pursue a career in journalism. Um, but his view at the time uh, probably was not that unusual. Ho hopefully it's changed since then. So let me also just share with you uh, a little bit of the work on this topic that was done by the Robert Floyd Johnson Foundation recently. Um, and this was specific to a Medicaid population, but it looked at individual and family engagement in the process of care. And I think what this does is it gives us um, um, the introduction of a concept that I think will be important to all of you as you enter practice, and that is patient activation. So patient activation is a patient's knowledge, skills, ability, and willingness to manage his or her own health and care. And then they draw a, a contrast with the topic of patient engagement here, patient engagement being a broader concept. But I think what's important to all of you as you think about this is the concept of patient activation. So we really need to help activate our patients to become more empowered, to become more knowledgeable, to become more expert, and to become more accountable for their own health care. I think that will be very important to you in the future. And the work of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation actually um, demonstrated that in this Medicaid population, this helped achieve the triple aim, which is improved health care, better patient care, better outcomes, and lower costs. And I'll just mention this organization um, because um, I've been spending um, some of my time with um, people who represent this organization. And I've talked uh, this morning, actually, with uh, a number of your faculty members about this organization. If you don't know them, it would be uh, good for you to learn a little bit about them. But this is the Patient Center and Outcomes Research Institute. It was created by the um, Affordable Care Act, and it's funded by the government, although not a government organization, it's an independent organization. But PCORI exists to um, develop and support research to give patients information that they need to make decisions about their own health care. And PCORI says there's no agreed upon definition of patient empowerment among researchers, although they do actually propose some um, uh, definitions for that. And there, this organization is fresh on my mind because I spent the day um, in a meeting that they hosted on Monday of this week talking about a very powerful research engine that if it comes to fruition, I think could really change um, the way we, we uh, manage healthcare in the future. It's called the CoreNet, and it's basically a connection, a large uh, um, information network uh, connecting electronic health records from many health systems in the country. And researchers as well as practitioners will be able to use this information to answer questions, to conduct research. So I think it's very powerful. It's something for us to keep uh, our eye on, and I think it could be very important to all of you if, 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 as we think about the availability of real-world data that we can actually tap into and see what's the impact of the care that we're providing. We can even look at it in the context of the 
services that we as pharmacists provide, what are the impact of those services on rehospitalization rates, on patient satisfaction, on cost, on so many different parameters. So it, it could open up an important world for us. But I'd like to shift gears for just a minute and tell you about some of those trailblazers that I mentioned early on. In 2009, um, Regina Holliday lost her husband to stage four renal cancer just weeks after he was diagnosed. Regina at the time was a young mother of an infant in her 30s and left alone by the death of her husband. What happened with Regina, though, was that she and her husband were so um, taken aback by his diagnosis, which was incredibly unexpected at the time, and they were trying to navigate the healthcare system um, against all odds to try to figure out, uh, first of all, what uh, Fred was suffering from, and then second of all, what they might do about it um, to get the treatment that he needed. So at one point, he was in the hospital, and he was being transferred to another hospital uh, to see a specialist. And Regina was sent by the hospital staff down to medical records to obtain a copy of his medical records to take with them to the other hospital. She went to medical records and was told that they would be glad to produce a copy of his medical records, and it would cost her 83 cents a page, and that she would receive them in approximately 21 days. Well, Fred died before the medical records came in, and six days after his death, Regina, an artist, picked up a paintbrush and started to paint. She created something called the, the Walking Gallery, and if you have a chance, you can just Google it. You can read her blog. It's, it's very interesting. But her platform is all about patients having access to their own healthcare information. And she started this Walking Gallery. It's called the Walking Gallery because it literally is walking. Uh, she paints on jackets. And uh, this is my jacket that she painted for me last year when she came to the DIA meeting in San Diego. Um, my jacket tells the story of the one-third of patients who never get their prescriptions filled. And you, you can't see it very well from this picture, but it's a pharmacist who's trying to help the one-third of patients. You can see that she's painted uh, hundreds of these jackets along with her army of about 30 other artists that she's enlisted. Uh, these are just a few of the people that came with their jackets uh, to our meeting last year. Uh, the tall gentleman that you'll see there is Dr. Eric Topol, who's written a tremendous amount on digital health care and patient empowerment. Um, and he's been part of the walking gallery for a number of years. So Regina is one of those heroes, as is this gentleman, in, in my opinion. Um, this is Jamie Haywood, and in 2009, I'm sorry, 1999, Jamie's brother, Stephen, was diagnosed with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And I'm sure most of you know what that is, but just in case, it's a progressive neurological disease um, that is fatal. And at the time, there was no known treatment or cure. Um, Jamie and his other brother, Benjamin, and a friend of theirs, all MIT-trained engineers, band together to try to find something that would extend Stephen's life. And from that grew an organization called Patients Like Me. And if you haven't had a chance to look at Patients Like Me or you haven't heard about it, I would um, encourage you to take a look. It's one of many um, online patient portals that is, has morphed into a patient-driven research engine. There, um, at, at the time that the picture uh, preceding this was taken, Jamie was speaking at our annual meeting last year, and there were over a quarter of a million patients who had signed up to participate in patients like me. They were tracking, I believe at the time, about 25 disease states, and there had been over 40 articles published, research articles, published in uh, the healthcare and medical literature uh, with research derived from this patient portal. They've gone on to forge relationships with companies that are developing therapies, both medical devices as well as pharmaceuticals, and they're using the data from patients like me to help design clinical trials, um, to help collect patient reported outcomes, um, to help explore what's of interest and importance to patients as, as they look at treating their disease. Just another snapshot of what you see on patients like me. Very fascinating. 
And then while we're uh, queuing up a video, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, a, another um, couple of patient heroes. And I'll say that this is a bit of an extreme version of patient heroes. Um, there, there are a couple, uh, Chris and her husband, Hugh Kimpel, who live in Southern California. And they have twin daughters, Addie and Cassie, who at a very young age were diagnosed with a catastrophic and fatal uh, and very rare condition, only 500 people in the world have it, called neiman pick type C disease. Now, if it sounds familiar to you, you may have seen an article uh, a couple of years ago, or even as recent as a couple of weeks ago, um, there was an, a follow-up article in the Wall Street Journal about this disease. Wall Street Journal ran a six-part series in 2013 about um, their battle with this disease. So Chris and Hughes became citizen scientists, and they struck out to not only advocate for their daughters and uh, try to get the care their daughters need, but actually to find a cure for the disease. So they worked with uh, a group of individuals to convince the National Institutes of Health and also the Food and Drug Administration to allow a clinical trial in a very small subset of these patients uh, to see if the drug was effective. This will tell you a little bit about their story. <coughs> Up until they were three years old, the girls were just going through the normal process, getting their vaccinations and regular checkups, and they were healthy. Our life was perfect. And then the day came where we found out that they had enlarged spleens. If you have symptoms early in life, like they did, the average lifespan is probably about 10 years. There's nothing worse as a parent than to hear, your child's dying and there's nothing you can do. You come to find out there are no drugs. You know, uh, there's nothing. Of the 7,000 diseases or so that affect the human family, there are treatments available for about 500 of them. I really hate the word patient because we're all patients. Until you're touched by a disease, you may not realize that there is no department of cures. Just like entrepreneurs, at the beginning, they didn't know what they didn't know. They don't want to be entrepreneurs in this space, but they have to. I'm just a mom. I just want to treat my kids. I want to try to save their lives. Dramatic change only happens when outsiders and individuals can drive change. If you just don't get moving and start taking action, then the inevitable is going to happen. You're, you know, our kids are going to die. There's enormous hope enormous opportunity. It is a matter of will. The answers are in us. They're, they're somewhere in us. From a social point of view, this is the time we all need to really be together and working on things together.
um, progressing through from food and water on through other needs of life uh, to the highest level, which is the level of self-actualization. So this is a model that was created to look at the patient engagement py pyramid. And so you can see at the very bottom, you're looking at patients as um, consumers of healthcare products and services. And then the equivalent to self-actualization at the top is this level where patients are responsible for their own health care, they're engaged, they manage their own health care, they set goals, and they have full access not only to their own information, as Regina would have it, but also to their health care team. So I took the liberty of um, developing a patient engagement pyramid for us as pharmacists. And so, um, We'll, uh, there's nothing scientific here, but we'll call it Cantrell's uh, hierarchy of patient engagement, <laughs> if you will. But at the bottom, we have um, patients receiving their medications, which might have been traditional pharmacy practice a long time ago. But you can see in my model, uh, patients move up from being a customer to a trusting patient. And then they move further to a consulting patient where there's patient pharmacists or patient healthcare professional interpersonal communication. And you can see below that uh, there's the element of trust, which I think is so important, and it will be so important to all of you entering the profession. You have to build trust and credibility with the patients in order to move up this pyramid. And when you get to the very top, you have the engaged patient, where the patient will be turning to you as first line for their medication related needs. So that's what it will look like in Cantrell's perfect world in the future. So we'll see how far we go and in what period of time. So I'd just like to say um, in closing a few remarks about what we're here today uh, for. As I prepared to come speak to you today, I thought uh, I had heard so much about Dean Hartman in my entire time at Ole Miss and afterwards. Mm -hmm. I haven't been to this lecture before, but I wanted to learn a little bit more about what to expect. So I um, contacted a few people whose uh, opinion I value, and uh, one I knew might have some insight. It was a uh, former professor here, Joe Berg. I sent him a message and said, do you have any suggestions <coughs> on how I might best prepare myself and how I might approach this uh, prestigious assignment? And his recommendation was that I get the book that was written by another one of our professors, uh, former professors, Nikki Smith, um, that's called Hello, I'm Charlie Hartman. So Amazon didn't have it. I called Square Books. They did. They sent me a copy. And I got to read about Dean Hartman. And I have to say, um, I was inspired by reading about him and also disappointed that I never had the opportunity to get to know him because what he did for the school and this university and really the state of Mississippi um, in terms of putting the, the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy on the map um, was nothing short of incredible. And we have to think about the time when he did it. It was in the 60s when I can only imagine that recruiting a, a world-renowned faculty to the University of Mississippi when what we were reading at the time in, in the newspapers and, and seeing on television if we had it uh, would have been very much about uh, violence and repression and not um, this beautiful, magical place that we're, we visit here today. So his charge was very difficult, and I can't imagine how he did it, but he succeeded. And I benefited greatly from his success, just as you are benefiting from it today, and the legacy continues. So I could not be prouder to be a graduate of this school, to have been invited to speak with you today, and I thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions.
are, are reaching those levels that you're, you know, to the engagement and I guess particularly just making sure that as a retail that we, we're doing the same strides that a hospital setting would be doing. So I think that is really important um, as we think about this whole topic of patient engagement. And also, um, all of us know probably that there uh, is a bill before the U.S. Congress, not the first time, but um, looks like it has a better chance of success this time, um, that if passed would designate pharmacists as, as uh, providers of health care services um, according to the government payers. Um, so that, that would be very important to our profession. But the pharmacists, our, our colleagues who practice in the community and retail pharmacy setting, they're the face of the profession. So um, uh, they need to bring their A-game. There's no question about it because that's how um, so much of the uh, public, so many patients that we deal with uh, will judge us. So I think it's really important. And I would say um, I see that that's happening. Um, I know recently um, there have been some um, uh, movements in certain um, pharmacies to really make that uh, pharmacy chain, in, in this case, uh, a healthcare uh, delivery area as opposed to a retail store, if you will. And I think that's going to be the, the most important part. I don't know about all of you, but um, I, I have to confess that I sometimes get a little frustrated when I go into a pharmacy because it feels more like a retail experience to me than it does a healthcare encounter. And that's even uh, sometimes when I'm being counseled by the pharmacist or getting an immunization. So I think we have to think about how do we make that um, more of a professional experience. Um, but I see the profession moving in that direction. So I have faith that we'll do that. Hello. Thank you for uh, that wonderful talk. I, uh, <laughs> somebody else have a microphone? Did you say something ever? I'm waiting in line. I'm just hanging out. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> hey, you go ahead. Okay. So, uh, in, in Susan Cantrell's pyramid, uh, in the first world, you have at the top the interaction of patients and their pharmacists. I personally, uh, when I look for drug information, or, or I go to the internet, and uh, my first response is not to go to pharmacists. Um, so that goes back to the information that the patient can trust, where do they go, and how do you alter that to, to sort of work in the favor of, of a pharmacist? Well, I'm big on education, and a lot of my work in my career has centered around educating pharmacists, physicians, and other healthcare providers, um, and to a certain extent, patients now. Um, so I think there is an element of education that will be so important. And I also think that um, we talked earlier about um, the interest in the Food and Drug Administration and looking at what mobile apps and other sources of information or healthcare data, wearable devices, for example, might be considered regulated medical devices. And so we really don't have a safety valve right now when it comes to this um, um, amount of overwhelming amount of information in some cases um, that is available in a variety of sources as well as um, mobile apps that we can download in many cases for free. Um, we don't know how well those are constructed. We don't know if the information that we're getting from those sources in all cases is, is valid, um, scientifically rigorous, or is it perhaps junk science? It's junk science. Um, so I think we have to be careful, and I think that's an opportunity for us, um, educating our patients, educating uh, the general public as well on um, being aware, being careful. There are a few things that we can do immediately to determine um, to what extent a source of information that we're looking at is valid. So I think that uh, should be part of what we look at as we think about how we interact with patients in the future. We're going to educate them about their medications, how to manage their health care condition, when to seek treatment, about safety issues with medications. But we also, to a certain extent, need to figure out how we will help educate them about the information that they receive. Thanks, Dr. Ramali. <laughs> uh, 
First off, I want to say thank you for uh, coming to speak to us today. I know that from the student perspective, it is, uh, it's really refreshing seeing this type of information and lecture because uh, I believe it's more, more if not, more if not the same as important as our traditional bench top science work we do and all about the drugs because this is how we express our value as a healthcare provider and uh, without it we would just be uh, no more than an app on a phone. Um, so uh, coming from a student perspective, having said that, how, how could you say we could better empower patients from a student perspective coming into the professional world? I think, um, with, um, not to belabor the point about my uh, pyramid, but one thing as I was thinking through that process is um, in empowering patients, they need to understand, part of empowerment is you're taking accountability and responsibility for an outcome, and that's the patient that we need in the future. We can no longer have this uh, paternalistic type of um, healthcare uh, service. We have to have patients stepping up to the plate and assuming some level of responsibility. So I think we need to tell them that, uh, for one thing, and make sure that uh, we equip them with the information and the tools that they need in order to be able to do that. And I think um, a, a good step in the right direction for getting to that conversation, too, is we obviously need our patients to have that level of trust in us. Um, any healthcare provider does. You have to have trust and credibility. So uh, building trust and then sharing the information, providing guidance, but also holding the patient accountable to a certain extent. I think all those things would be important. You mentioned consolidated healthcare information. What is your viewpoint on it? And what measures are being taken to protect that information from hackers and other sources? Well, that's a scary thing. Um, I, I know very little about cybersecurity, unfortunately, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if we're doing enough. Um, I do know in my organization, um, being a global organization, we deal with um, privacy policies and uh, data security policies from around the world. And in comparison to some other areas, um, ours here in the U.S. are quite weak. However, there are some countries where um, the, the um, rules are so rigorous as to prevent the type of knowledge and data sharing that is needed. And I think if you've read recently about the, the tragedy of the um, flight that went down in, in the Alps recently um, due to the co-pilot, um, part of uh, what's being debated in some of the literature right now is are the German policies on uh, data privacy of healthcare information so rigorous as to have prevented the airline from being able to properly screen the co-pilot. I don't want to be a party to that uh, debate, although I do have an opinion about it, but um, I, I think that is an important issue. And, you know, it's just like anything that's, that's new. Um, it's uh, very difficult to figure out what's the right balance of regulation that doesn't stifle innovation, but it protects um, both intellectual property as well as the users of, of the information. So I think it's going to be, unfortunately, a while before we have the answer to that. Um, about two months ago, the Institute of Medicine came out with a paper on uh, clinical trial <coughs> data sharing. And we're moving to a point where all companies who conduct clinical trials will basically be reported to share, um, in some cases, even patient-level data uh, with one another. So this will greatly fuel our ability to uh, speed up innovation to bring new products to market, but there's a tremendous risk when it comes to data privacy. And so we have to sort all that out. I think it's going to take us a while to do it, um, and I don't think it will be easily done. Please join me in thanking Susan Kendrick.